Today, we're going to be focusing on fair housing issues and tenant landlord issues that may be found in senior buildings. So we invite you to um, ask any questions for our panelists using the Q&A feature in this webinar. So if you look at the bottom part of your screen, you'll see a little button with two cartoon talk bubbles um, that says Q&A and you can type your question in and then we'll make sure that it gets answered during the webinar. If you have any tech questions, you can also use that Q&A feature as a chat and our tech support will be on hand to answer any questions for you. So again, my name is Ann Hinterman. I am the Director of Housing and Community Affairs for Alderman James Kappelman here in the 46th Ward. And I am so pleased to be joined by Danielle McCain, who is an attorney, a civil rights practitioner. She is the Associate Director of the Writing Resource Center at the John Marshall Law School here in Chicago and the Program Manager for their Senior Project. We also have with us Attorney Lewis Powell, who has been practicing um, eviction law and specializing in um, eviction practices. So he is joining us to talk about how that may apply in senior buildings at this point during COVID. And Professor Michael Seng, who is a professor at UIC's John Marshall Law School. He's also the director of the John Marshall Fair Housing Clinic. So thank you so much, team. We're so happy to have you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just say a few words about the um, Fair Housing Center and clinic that we have at, uh, uh, at UIC John Marshall Law School. Uh, and then uh, Danielle will uh, speak more specifically about uh, uh, issues in senior housing and uh, Lewis then will uh, talk more uh, about landlord tenant issues and, and those types of things uh, that can, can uh, come up. Uh, the John Marshall uh, a Law School established the uh, Fair Housing Center and Clinic uh, over 30 years ago now. Uh, we've been, um, uh, our mission is to uh, educate the public, to um, educate uh, consumers, housing providers, government officials, um, fair housing investigators uh, on fair housing law, and also attorneys, because uh, at attorneys often don't know the implications uh, of the fair housing law. Fair housing, incidentally, doesn't necessarily mean housing in, in its broad sense must be fair. Uh, what it means is uh, that it must be free from certain types of discrimination. At the federal level, there's seven protected classes. Uh, at the uh, local level, uh, there are many, many more uh, uh, protected classes. But many different aspects of housing, as Danielle and Lewis will explain, are affected uh, by the fair housing laws. Uh, and especially right now uh, in a time of pandemic, uh, we're seeing the relationship of housing uh, with public health, uh, with employment, with transportation, with education, uh, virtually everything uh, in the city of Chicago uh, in these times is uh, uh, influenced by housing. And we're also seeing by the uh, recent Black Lives Movement that when it comes to police practices in different neighborhoods uh, and uh, 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 responses, uh, that a lot of that uh, really is tied into uh, our problem in Chicago with uh, segregated housing and segregated uh, uh, communities. Uh, so uh, now is a, a really interesting time uh, to re-examine uh, housing concepts, fair housing concepts, and the whole concept of discrimination and how it can impact on our lives. Uh, and when it comes to senior issues, a number of years ago, uh, the, uh, the center did a study uh, for the Retirement Research Foundation, uh, which is a national foundation uh, that studies senior issues. Uh, and we particularly found uh, that particularly in senior housing, uh, race discrimination, national origin discrimination, um, and uh, in many ways, uh, disability discrimination uh, are, are very, very alive uh, in senior uh, uh, facilities. Uh, and uh, there have recently been cases uh, involving the uh, LGBTQ community uh, in senior housing. So there's almost no aspect 
uh, of housing discrimination that does not come up in the senior community. Now under federal law, age itself is not a protected class. Under Illinois law, uh, it is. Uh, but whether or not it is a protected class under the fair housing laws, there are specific issues that affect uh, senior housing. Uh, Danielle, would you like to explain a little bit about how the fair housing laws and senior housing really interact? Sure, and I am, um, again, my name is Danielle McCain. I am program manager for uh, uh, senior programming at the um, center, uh, the UIC John Marshall uh, Fair Housing Center. Um, so I'm going to cover two topics today. One is going to be um, giving you some background on the Fair Housing Act and identifying specific um, events or specific uh, things that occur um, that might affect you as seniors um, in housing. And then I'm going to pivot a bit and talk about some of the um, ways in which seniors are exploited, and it is a full range out, including housing, but outside of housing as well, and give some uh, tips uh, about how to address those issues, and then talk specifically about some new scams that um, we've learned about um, with, uh, within the, the realm of COVID-19, which has opened the door to all kinds of um, ways in which uh, folks are trying to exploit seniors, which will then transition well because um, Professor F Powell will then talk about um, COVID and specifically related to evictions and some of the other things that we are seeing in housing. So I wanted to kind of level set and get everyone on the same page of where we're moving and going um, because we're covering a lot in our uh, hour. Um, and then we will have some time for some question and answer at the end. So the Federal Ho Fair Housing Act, um, as amended, prohibits landlords, real estate agents, home sellers, banks, and other housing providers from discriminating against people based on race, color, national origin, sex, familial status, and disability. Um, as Professor Sang uh, noted here, age in Illinois, age is a protected class. Um, anyone who is injured by a discriminatory housing practice can make a claim under the fair housing, uh, under fair housing laws. Um, this includes caregivers and family members who are impacted by the de denial of um, housing. Um, I want to go to a couple of examples um, because I always think that is um, a great way for seniors to get a sense of what we mean by fair housing, what we mean by what's protected, and what we mean by, you know, by your rights. What are your rights? So these are situations that are illegal under the Fair Housing Act or um, state or local laws. A senior home for, for independent living requires that all applicants be able to walk to the dining room and prohibits the use of motorized wheelchairs. A senior home with independent units refuses to rent to women. It was established in the early 20th century as, home, as a home for elderly gentlemen. It arranges its activities around sporting events and regularly arranges for a bus to transport the residents to baseball and basketball games. Okay. Um, a condominium association refuses to allow seniors to modify, a senior to modify her unit at her own expense by building a ramp in front of her unit to accommodate her lack of mobility caused by a stroke. A nursing facility questions an African-American senior why he wants to live in the home that is predominantly white and suggests that he might be, suggests that he might be more comfortable in another home that is predominantly African American. A senior independent living facility threatens to apply its no guest policy to prevent a senior suffering with Parkinson's disease from housing a caregiver in the second bedroom of his unit and tells him that he must move to the nursing home in the complex. A grandmother who wants to take in her newly orphaned grandson is told by the apartment owner that unless she obtains legal custody through a court, the grandson cannot live without her or cannot live with her. A senior is suffering from depression and her doctor advises her to get a cat as a support animal, but her building has a no pets policy and has informed her that she will have to move if she acquires a pet. The same housing provider later relents, but tells the senior that she will be assessed a charge for the support animal. 
a senior moves into a new building, built a uh, newly built building, uh, multifamily uh, unit, and finds that it does not meet the accessibility standards set forth in the FHA. And then finally, a senior apartment complex advertises that it caters to able-bodied seniors who lead an active lifestyle and enjoy playing sports. So those are a range of examples where um, events and activities may occur that seniors um, should you know, be concerned about, should raise issue to, and may in fact be a violation of their fair housing rights. I think those examples cover disability, they cover um, uh, gender discrimination, they cover um, uh, uh, accommodations, and a whole range of issues that seniors may face that fall um, within the protections of the Fair Housing Act as well as um, local laws. So um, when the situation occurs and there is a question as to whether or not you're being discriminated against, I think these are some good examples to um, measure and also just give rise to contacting the Fair Housing Center at UIC, John Marshall Law School, or sharing that information with your provider. So then there can be an evaluation and determination of whether or not you are experiencing um, fair housing uh, or, or discrimination um, in housing. Um, I say that because a lot of times um, senior populations, and I'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to financial exploitation, um, feel very isolated in certain experiences that they're having. Um, and don't want to share, um, don't want to seem as if they don't know what's going on or how to handle a situation. So it's important to take that step when something occurs that is concerning and reach out to your housing provider, reach out to your local organization. It could be the 46th, 46th Ward, um, the Alderman's Office, reach out to those resources that are available to you um, to then figure out what is the best way to handle the situation um, that you're, you know, that you're experiencing and what you're going through. Because a lot of times there, you know, there is help out there and there's certainly assistance to help you figure out what's going on and if in fact you are experiencing discrimination because of your senior status. So with that, I'm going to actually share my screen and transition into talking about, um, uh, for a while, talking about uh, protecting seniors from financial exploitation. So I shared the brochure that we have um, at uh, the center that is very, very helpful in breaking down the different ways in which seniors um, experience uh, financial exploitation and are actually more vulnerable to uh, that exploitation. Um, it is a lot of information. So in my presentation, I try to um, dig through and get to the core of what is important. Um, but I would say uh, uh, the 46th uh, Ward, we did share that uh, brochure. So um, it, it, I think it will be emailed to you. So then you'll have the opportunity to look through it more um, at, at, you know, at a different point, but at this point, at this time, I'm just going to pull out some information and I'm going to do that by way of a few scenarios, which, um, I feel like are always very helpful, um, to discuss and, um, just, uh, establish kind of what's going on, what you're experiencing and what you should do. So I'm going to move on to that right now and I'm going to share my screen. Is it? Where is it? Where is it? It's open. It's open. Okay. Um. All right. Let me. Let's see. Okay. All right, give me one moment. Let me try this again. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's see. 
Are you on your end? Are you seeing the PowerPoint presentation? No. Yes. 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 No. Can you all see it? Yes or no? Okay. Let me go back again. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm going to now start the slideshow. Perfect. Okay. So again, we're transitioning to protecting seniors from financial exploitation. Um, some of uh, our learning goals for today are to first identify a fraud and then um, from there learn how to protect yourself um, in these situations when they occur and then locate resources um, that are available to you um, um, through different agencies as well as um, within uh, your, own, your own spaces. Okay, so what? Um, we're gonna use a what, when, and how framework. So the what is, um, you know, there are individuals and, and groups that are looking to take advantage of you for their benefit. Um, <clears throat> one of the, 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 the challenges in, you know, when a fraud occurs is the fact that, you know, as a senior, you have less opportunity to recover. Uh, you've oftentimes are retired or you're working a lot less and um, if you're taken advantage of financially, um, you know, you just don't have the resources available to then recover um, from, you know, that type, of, that type of financial hit or that type of financial situation. When does it occur? Typically with seniors, 65 and older, sometimes 55 and older. Um, and what we see often is um, it's an urgent and um, immediate type of situation. So you have, uh, you know, uh, there's some damage to your, to your property because of weather. And now you need to, you know, get, uh, get your roof uh, fixed or you need to get, um, you know, you need to get money or you need to get, you know, whatever it is, but it's urgent and immediate at the time. Um, and that puts a lot of du duress, what we call duress on the situation, which makes you even more susceptible because you may not th be thinking as clearly as you typically would because of the stress of the situation, the immediacy and the urgency of the situation. Where um, these types of scams and frauds can take place in person, they can take place over the phone, they can take place uh, uh, they can take place online, and sometimes it does happen in the uh, via mail. Uh, the in person could be you know someone coming to your door. Um, trying to share with you information about uh, a reverse mortgage, which in itself may not necessarily be a bad thing, but depending on the circumstances and how they approach you, um, it can be a fraud or get, trying to get you to sell your property or you know something along those lines, but it shows up in various ways and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. The why, um, senior populations are um, you know, often established uh, established people that, um, you know, do not really want to seek advice. Um, sometimes it's because, you know, you want to keep your affairs private or you don't want to seem like after, you know, being on this earth all these years, you, you know, you've been taken advantage of or you didn't make um, the best decision. And then thirdly, you just don't want to be a burden on someone um, if you've gotten yourself into a situation or been a victim of a fraud. Um, so those are things that, you know, make your population, in addition to the age, um, you know, a little bit more vulnerable to scams and frauds. Okay, and the how. We see it in uh, financial transactions, we see it in legal documents, we see it in loans, we see it in contractors. Um, it shows up in, you know, in various ways. Um, so it's important for you to have a sense um, as a senior population about, you know, what, when you're getting into a transaction or needing a legal document prepared or needing a loan um, or um, looking to, um, um, you know, work with a contractor, whatever it is, um, you're that level of awareness um, that you want to be very clear about what the transaction is and what's happening and so on, so that you aren't uh, the victim of a fraud, but knowing the how is um, essential to doing that. 
Okay, so we're going to jump into some scenarios and I am not sure and the best way um, to, uh, to do this. Typically, if we were all together, I'd have folks raise their hands and answer um, the questions and give me some feedback before, um, before we do that. So I don't know if that could be handled in the chat, um, but I'll give a little time to, for, you know, for there to be an answer. So what would you do? You have a leak in your roof and call a contractor to come and look at it. Riley and Sons give you an estimate for $2,500 and you tell it and you, you think it's a good deal for such a big leak. You agree to hire them, but they ask for full payment up front. What would you do? And if we folks any... want to put this in the Q&A, we can use that like a chat feature. That would be, that would be perfect. Any answers, thoughts? I have a, what do these type? I wouldn't give them the money is one answer. Okay, good. Any other answers? Any other steps that you would take? So if you didn't give them the, the money, what else would you do? I'd ask them for references. Okay, that's a great answer. That's something that you should definitely do. Okay, those are, are good responses. So let's, let's look at what we should do. So the first thing is do your research and get more than one estimate. Check references um, as um, one of the seniors uh, suggested. Um, the other thing is make sure you have a written agreement with the contact information for the company and the terms of work. We often see um, agreements or, you know, sometimes you don't have any information. Like you have the name, but not an address, not a phone number, um, not an email address. So. You wanna make sure you have that. And then in terms of payment, not paying it all up front, break it down into a third um, up front, and then you pay the rest at the end or you, you know, schedule out payments along the way. So those are ways in which you protect yourself. Um, and in terms of an agreement, it doesn't have to be a formal contract, but you need to know, each side needs to know what they're responsible for um, and what they're, you know, what they're required to do. Okay. Let's move on. So the next one, your cousin Louise sends an email that states, I am in desperate need of your help. I'm sure you guys have had this experience. I certainly have. I'm in desperate need of your help. I'm stranded in Jamaica and I have lost my wallet. I'm not able to get back home. Please send money to me right away to the below address. So what would you do? Any thoughts around that? Does this happen to anybody? <laughs> I know that we get emails like this to our general email box at mm -hmm. the alderman's office. Yes, it is a very prominent scam. It does not go away. <laughs> so yeah. it must be, it leads me to believe that it is very successful, um, unfortunately, um, because it continues to happen. When it okay. comes into the, the Ward 46 email address, um, our team deletes it. We don't okay. Respond. Okay, good. So, all right, well, let's go on and answer it because it shows up often. Um, and I was doing this with another group and they told me that um, the person felt really bad because it was from a similar email address to someone that he knew so he thought, oh, okay, this is coming from, you know, Joe Smith, so it should be okay, and I'm going to respond, and um, it ended up uh, being a scam. So the first thing that you do, if it's a family member or a friend, um, 
you reach out to see who last con who was last in contact with that person and you try to verify this information are they in fact stranded in you know mexico wherever they're stranded jamaica um and who's talked to that person is this you know is this a legitimate situation um if in fact it is true you make arrangement with family members to address the situation so um we're going to collectively as a family you know, take these steps to make sure we can get our loved person back home. Under no circumstances do you send money in the mail um, and you don't provide private bank information or give credit card information. And I must say that some of these things um, seem obvious, but, you know, under particular situations, um, given um, particular circumstances, um, people send this information, people provide this, um, and it can get confusing. So, um, you know, just a rule of thumb, do not send money in the mail, do not provide bank information or give credit information. Okay, I'm gonna do one more and then I really wanna start talking about COVID a little bit. Um, what would you do? Your niece has been helping you organize your affairs. Last month, she downloaded a power of attorney and told you you should sign it and make her your power of attorney. You've not had a chance to look at the document, but every time you talk to her, she asks if you signed it. Did you sign it yet? Have you signed it? Would you sign it? Did you sign it? So what would you do? Oops, I'm sorry, let me go back. What would you do? Any thoughts, answers, Any, anyone's had this experience? Okay, all right, so in light of time, we're just gonna move forward. One, you contact a lawyer to help with documents such as this, a power of attorney, a will, et cetera. Um, there's lots of avenues to get these things online and so, and, and, and so on, but you really want the expertise um, of a lawyer who is familiar with how this works and the laws and so on. Um, visit the lawyer on your own. You know, a lot of times there's influence um, from family members or friends um, who want you to sign these documents and not that the documents are bad, but you want to sign them um, because um, it is your personal need as well as um, you have a full understanding of what they mean. Um, so you want to visit a lawyer on your own and have these conversations. Um, and the final tip is don't sign any document if you need more information or if you are being pressured. The pressure that we saw in this scenario was the niece who, you know, is around often and was asking on a regular basis, did you sign it? Did you sign it? Did you sign it? Um, that is in fact pressure because it's not on your own terms. So you want to make sure that you don't sign any document if you need more information and if you are, um, being pressured. It should, like I said, be on your terms, um, whether or not you sign it. And um, you should have a full, complete, you know, understanding about what it means, um, you know, what the document means and, and what, would ha what happens as a result of signing that document. Okay. So I want to specifically talk about uh, COVID. I'm going to, well, I I'll mention this later. Um, well, let's go through it quickly. Your phone rings and you answer. The person on the other end tells you that they are representative from Medicare and wants to verify your benefits. The representative then asks, um, you know, for your social security number, what would you do? Um, do not ever give out your social security number, hang up the phone. If you have caller ID, write down the number and report the scam to Medicare. Uh, my rule of thumb for this is, um, you know, these agencies have your information and if they want, um, if they want, uh, they want to contact you, um, they will do it via mail. They will never call, they will never call you on the phone and they certainly won't call you and ask you for your social security number or any identifying information that they already have. So you want to be very careful, um, in, um, you know, avoid these conversations. And a lot of times they, you know, try to put you under duress. You have to answer now, I need this information. Sometimes it's, you know, calling on behalf of the police. Sometimes it's um, 
calling, you know, on behalf of a credit organization or, you know, um, the IRS or something like that. The IRS never calls you. Um, you will reach out to the IRS about whatever your situation is and it will be done via mail. So I'm going to move quickly and do like a couple of minutes um, just on COVID-19. Watch out for phishing scams, um, scams that are, um, uh, you know, asking you to pay money for information related to COVID or um, give out your uh, personal information in order to get, um, uh, you know, a COVID relief or um, anything related to COVID. Ignore offers for COVID-19 vaccine cure or treatment. We are far away um, from my perspective from having uh, a, a vaccine um, and certainly um, medical providers are providing treatments. All of these other kind of organizations and so on, you know, you have to be wary of their offers and typically there's some payment exchange related to it. Um, to that end, rely on sources for the most up-to-date information on COVID-19, the CDC, um, other uh, government agencies, your health provider, um, reputable people um, who have information on how to address whatever um, issue um, you may be having or questions that you have related to COVID-19. Remember that the safest place for your money is in the bank. Um, a lot of times when there's um, these situations, you know, a pandemic or, you know, just a, a situation that is of, you know, such um, an important uh, gravity and touching so many people, a lot of times the thought is, let me just move my stuff out of the bank. Um, it'll be safer. And it's a, you know, it's a, a, a nervous reaction, an anxious reaction to the situation. But the bottom line is the safest place for your money is in the bank. And um, the other thing that's coming up is donations, making donations to COVID victims, making donations to organizations um, that are uh, providing resources. So research the organization before making the donation, just because it is COVID-19 related and you're concerned, doesn't mean that you should just um, send your money in. So again, you know, I can't say enough how important it is to do your research. So I'm going to, we, I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to just move on um, from this. I will share these slides with um, Anne and uh, make sure that you have them because there's more information about COVID. But I am now going to, uh, oh, I'll just do a quick review. Do your research. Don't send money in the mail or provide financial information. If it comes to you and you didn't ask for it, it's probably a fraud. And then hang up the phone. Um, um, when these situations, when you, you know, recognize that this is probably um, a fraud or a scam, you don't have to sit there and listen. Um, you don't have to answer the phone as well. So um, please keep that in mind. I will be available for questions at the end. And I am now turning it over to Attorney Powell. Thank you. And let me stop here. Thank you, Danielle. Sure. Thank you. Excellent presentation. I'm going to give a, a brief overview on pandemic issues as it relates to evictions. And toward the end of my presentation, I'm going to stress the need for negotiation between landlords and tenants. Governor Prisker first enacted the first moratorium on evictions on March 9th. And essentially, he has been extend, extending it every 30 days. The, there's a moratorium on evictions residential evictions. The only way that you can file a residential eviction if that you can assert with good faith and with proof that the tenant is a danger to health, safety, health, and um, criminal activity. There is a nationwide moratorium, uh, Professor Sang, under the CDC Center for Disease Control, which essentially is saying that there will be no evictions, period, until the end of the year. But Professor Sang, a lot of uh, eviction attorneys are saying that it's, it's doubtful that this the CDC can uh, trump the state in terms of states' rights, in terms of telling them what to do, in terms of their own jurisdiction. But for all practical purposes, it appears that Governor Prisker will be continuing to extend the eviction the evictions against uh, moratoriums until the end of the year. In March 27th, 
of this year, the CARES Act went into effect. And what the CARES Act essentially says is that you as a housing provider or a landlord, you as a housing provider or a landlord have a property or not necessarily the property that the eviction is occurring in. If you have a property, a property that has a federally backed loan or you have a property, doesn't necessarily have to be the, the subject property in which eviction may be taking place, that you have a have a property that you that your tenants are receiving some type of federal subsidy that under the CARES Act it essentially had a 120 day hold starting March 27th, which means effectively that no eviction notice could be issued until June 24, no July 24 of 2020. And I'm sure we all accustomed to the five day notice for non payable rent. Instead of the five day notice for non payable rent, is the 30 day notice. The CARES Act says it has to be a 30 day notice, which essentially meant that the earliest that you timed the right, meaning that you served the eviction notice on July 24th, grant, grant it has to be a 30 day notice, that the earliest that you could file your eviction was essentially August 24th. Most eviction attorneys, and, and I include myself with them, we're taking the, uh, the interpretation that the CARES Act is still in effect, meaning I'm instructing all of my clients, instead of giving a five-day notice for failure to pay rent, instead of giving a 10-day notice for misbehavior or breach of the covenant, such as quiet enjoyment, making noise, uh, acts of violence, so forth and so on, that you would still give a, a 30-day notice which means essentially that the, that the tenant has 30 days to cure their misbehavior. Now, as a practical matter, I really want to you know, stress the practical matter. Right now, there's a, a serious bottleneck in the court system in Illinois. I have evictions that were filed pre-pandemic because the courts essentially shut down on or about March 13th in terms of being able to file new evictions. I have evictions that I filed pre-COVID, pre-March 13th, that are still stuck in the system. Because essentially the clerk's office, as well as the, the court system, are continually the, the, uh, the, the continue these cases. What the court system wants, they really are discouraging landlords, tenants, as well as attorneys from actively going to court. There are Zoom hearings that if you're not able, if you're not computer proficient, if you simply call in, rather than risk coming down to the Daily Center or any other uh, municipal center uh, to put yourself in harm's way. I have to stress that you as the landlord, you as the tenant, you're better off trying to come up to some type of reasonable accommodation in terms of trying to work out the situation. Uh, City Council in June of this year passed the know your rights ordinance, which basically essentially, we just use the five day notice as an example. They specifically say the five day notice time period is extended additional seven days. In those additional seven days beyond the five days, the housing provider, i.e. the landlord, as well as the tenant, have an obligation to at least try to resolve the situation. That doesn't mean that the tenant, that the landlord is obligated to go into a payment plan with the landlord, but the tenant and the landlord is obligated to at least engage the tenant with a, uh, in terms of trying to resolve it. How can you resolve it? If you're the landlord and the tenant? If you're the landlord, as we say, zero is a big number. A lot of landlords are not getting anything. We have a lot of people that are out of work. A lot of people are not really able to pay the full amount of rent. Some, some landlords, house providers, are working a situation out where they're taking a reduced payment in terms of their uh, rent that, that is due to them. Some landlords are saying pay rent, pay a lesser amount of rent and catch, it, catch up later, later on during the term of the lease. That way, you at least, you as the house provider, are at least getting something. What does a tenant get out of it? Eventually, the moratorium is going to end. And what we're worried about, it will, in terms of a after the end of the year, after the election, 
it's pretty obvious that they're going to probably lift the moratorium, meaning there are going to be a lot of evictions. So it behooves the tenant to try to work something out in terms of a payment plan if possible, or try to work out a situation where eventually that you move. As a tenant, you do not want to have on your record a judgment. Most people, landlords, house providers, are doing some form of background check. And a, a lot of landlords and house providers will hold it against you as a respected tenant if you have a blemish on your record, i.e. a judgment for possession on, on an eviction case. So it, it behooves you, both the tenant and the landlord, to try to work out some type of arrangement to pay something or eventually move without a blemish on, on, your, on your record. That is a, a brief overview in terms of the pandemic issues because it's the court system is in a, in a serious situation in terms of a serious backlog in terms of evictions moving forward. Repeating myself, just a brief overview. In terms of filing the eviction, you cannot file an eviction in the state of Illinois. The only exception would be commercial eviction. The only exception would be for residential eviction if the landlord could assert with good faith, i.e. proof, that the tenant is a threat to health, safety, welfare, or criminal activity. Those are the only cases that can be filed. Also, there's a serious backlog in the sheriff's office in terms of removing people from the premises. What are we talking about? After you get a judgment against an individual, if the tenant does not voluntarily move, move as according to the court order, you are, you are forced to pl place the order with the sheriff and then the sheriff has to go out and forcibly remove the tenants from the, from the premises. The sheriff's office is not doing that. The only exception is if you file a motion, have it heard by the judge, and have an issue order, an order issue that the sheriff will have to follow, this person should be evicted because again, there are, there are they are a threat to health, safety, and welfare. So that is a, a Reader's Digest version of the pandemic issues. Because of the situation that we're in, it is a situation that everybody is in their best interest to try to work out some type of arrangement uh, to move, pay, in a reasonable manner. I'm trying to leave room for questions. Yeah, thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions. So one has to do with the city of Chicago heating ordinance. So we know that by city ordinance, landlords have to provide heat um, at a minimum of 68 degrees during the day and 66 degrees at night, beginning September 15th. And we frequently have issues, especially in senior buildings, which tend to be large mid-rise buildings with clunky, HVAC systems, um, where at September 15th, the landlord will transition the system from air conditioning over to heat, regardless of the outdoor temperature. And the weather may still be really warm, so tenants are in a position where their units get very hot, and then they get upset when they hear it's because of the city ordinance. Do you have any recommendations or any, any way to reassure people about what's going on with that? Well, as we said off, off the air, I spent a lot of time in building court because I have a, represent property managers and small landlords. The city of Chicago takes heating issues very serious. If a, if a, if a tenant calls the city of Chicago, the city of Chicago will send out some, an inspector with a, a thermometer to gauge the temperature in the unit. And if the temperature is at, a, a, at an unacceptable level, they, the city of Chicago will file quickly, and I mean quickly, a, a, a complaint having the landlord housing provider in court and they will have to address the issue quickly, very promptly. So my advice is two, two things. One, call the city and simultaneously call your local alderman. They try to expedite the process to get to the building department to let them know there's a heating issue. And I trust me, 
they will come out to look at it. Are there any similar recommendations or requirements um, to have a maximum temperature? Because sometimes I'll, I'll have people say it's 90 degrees in my apartment. Does the city have a, the flip side of the heating ordinance? You know, I do not know. I just know that during a certain time period of year, the temperature has to be at a certain level. Whether there's a ceiling or not, I don't know. As we were talking off, you know, off camera, the problem is with older buildings at this time of year, you know, the heat should be on. However, right now the temperature is fluctuating back and forth. Some buildings are not set up where they can go one, you know, one day be, you know, the heat is on, the next day the air conditioning is on. It's a problem. And as we said, you know, we were talking before, a, a lot of housing providers, a lot of landlords are saying, look, whether than me being put at risk in terms of being cited for low heat, I'm just going to leave the heat on which forces uh, tenants to unfortunately do what? Open the window, because it's too hot. Okay, we have another question. How long is the backlog for eviction proceedings right now? As, as to say, it is a serious backlog for all intents and purposes. No one will be physically evicted from the premises after the judgment until after the end of the year. With the only caveat, the only exception would be if the house provider, i.e. the landlord, can prove to, to the court's satisfaction that the tenant is a threat to health, safety, welfare, criminal activity, so forth and so on, in terms of being physically evicted. Recapping, in terms of filing a new case, again, no residential eviction. You can file commercial eviction. No residential evictions, again, unless you can assert with proof that the tenant is a threat to health, safety, and welfare, i.e. criminal activity. What would constitute your proof? You know what? The judges, it varies between judges because sometimes the judge will take into account that it's a pro se litigant, but proof is because they don't want you to be in court with you to show, you know, pictures of the property in distress, i.e. holes in the walls, so, so forth and so on, i.e. garbage all over the place, i.e. because the tenant has obligation to keep the, his, the, his or her unit sanitary. So in terms of proof, they're allowing you to send by email what you have in terms of pictures. Because again, the court really does not want anyone to be physically there. So a follow-up to that, uh, somebody asked, if you get an eviction notice during this moratorium on evictions, what should you do? As I said earlier, negotiation. It's, it's a two-way street. Eventually, this moratorium is gonna be lifted. Eventually. You, it, it is in your best interest as the tenant to try to work something out with the landlord. As we said earlier, zero is a big number. A lot of my clients are back, back is against the wall. There are some subsidies out there for tenants. I know I, I, IDHI, IDA has a subsidy program that tenants can apply for, that they can get a stipend that will go, go toward their rent. So it is to everyone's advantage to try to work something out. To you as a tenant to avoid having an eviction record on, you know, having an eviction on your record. You as a landlord to try to try to work out something where you are getting some type of rent. It may not be all the rent, but some type of rent. Because again, because of the backlog, and I hope I'm answering your question. If you get a notice, you know, a lot of tenants are taking advantage of this situation. There are a lot of tenants that could be paying the rent, but they feel this is the opportunity for them to live rent, rent free and use that rent money for something else. But also there are a lot of people out there that simply because of unemployment issues, they simply do not honestly have the, the money to pay the rent. So again, if you, if you get a notice, try to be proactive. Try to reach out to the landlord 
to try to reach to try to reach some type of resolution. Don't just sit on it because you know that the court system is is backed up. Don't sit on it. Don't you, you know? Don't use that to advantage. Use that as a situation to try to work them out with the with the landlord. Thanks. And I know at our session on Tuesday, we had Michelle Gilbert, who is the new legal director for the Lawyers Committee for Better Housing Eviction Prevention Program. And she mentioned that she works with a team of attorneys who are available to work with landlords and tenants um, to find ways to negotiate. So if anybody is looking for a third party to come in and support you as you try to negotiate, um, you can contact the eviction prevention program. So I will put the contact information in the chat for that. We have another question. If a tenant gets COVID, can a landlord evict them based on that? And I'd like to add to that, if you could speak to not only senior independent living buildings, we've gotten some complaints about this from nursing homes where someone um, is diagnosed with COVID, goes to the hospital, and because the nursing home doesn't have a way to isolate people once they return, they don't have a, a COVID wing, they're told uh, that they can't return to their home in the nursing home. I'm going to address it very briefly and turn it over to Danielle and Professor Sang. I believe that you cannot file an eviction action on the basis of someone being diagnosed with COVID. I, I just don't think that that's possible. The fair housing issue and Professor Sang and Danielle, I think it may be better to defer to them. But again, I don't think a housing provider will be within its rights to try to evict someone because they, they've been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a complicated area. Um, under the Fair Housing Act, you're considered to be disabled if you have a physical or mental disability that substantially limits a major life activity, or you're regarded as having such a, a limitation, or you have a history of it. So. If you simply have tested positive with nothing else, there's a question whether you, you have a disability that substantially limits a late major life activity. Uh, with that said, if you're under quarantine and that type of thing, you're certainly regarded uh, as having certain um, uh, uh, limitations. Uh, so you, you have to the the you have to get sort of by that first issue. Is this a a disability case? The other thing that the law provides that if you're a threat to the health of others, the health or safety of others, uh, you uh, uh, you're not covered uh, as a a member of a a protected class under the uh, disability provisions. Uh, the problem on that, again, is you can't rely on stereotypes. You've got to rely on the individual uh, a case. Uh, so obviously, um, one of the considerations is if the person can be separated, if they can be quarantined uh, so that they would not be a serious danger to the health of others, uh, then they would be protected. Um, if there were no way to protect a person, and in in that situation, it, it there, there's no uh, de definitive answer. Uh, would you have a different uh, view, uh, Danielle? No, um, I actually think you covered it well. I think it is complicated and you know circumstantial. So depending on the, you know, the facts of the situation, I think will, you know, be more determinant and helpful in terms of what you should do and whether they'll be protected or not. Yeah, the, the analogy is, uh, for instance, uh, the government has said if you, for instance, have infectious uh, tuberculosis, that might be a disease uh, that would uh, not allow you to live uh, in a uh, in an area where you would be a danger uh, uh, to others. 
Uh, on the other hand, if it's a uh, something like AIDS, uh, the congressional record and everything is clear uh, that if you're infected with HIV, if you have AIDS, uh, that that is not the type of infectious disease uh, that would be covered. Uh, COVID ID, uh, uh, the COVID-19 is obviously very uh, communicable, uh, but um, again, it, it's it's just unclear in, in terms uh, how the government would go about uh, enforcing the law in that situation. Thank you so much. So we have time for one more question, if anybody has one. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our presenters. Uh, we are so appreciative of you sharing your time and expertise with us today. I will put the contact information for Alderman Kappelman's office in the chat. So if anybody has questions that come up in the future, you can call or email us and we will be happy to get an answer um, to any of your questions from our experts today. And um, we'll also be able to share Danielle's presentation and any other resources that we had here today. Okay. Well, if there are not any other questions, we will conclude right now. So Lewis and Michael and Danielle, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope it was useful.